Good evening, everyone, on a pleasant Wednesday, except if you're living out in California, we're praying for you. And seriously, we are. We are yeah. praying for you, dear folks out there. <clears throat> Tonight on OBW Talks, we have people on the screen. Mm -hmm. We have a multitude of people on the screen, and for good reason. We have Elder James Mosley. Hey, Brother James, how are you tonight? I'm doing well. Glad to be here. Good and we have Elder, what's that guy's name? Daniel Montgomery. Yay! Hello, Brother Son. Hello, how are you doing? Hello Brother Dad. Good to see you. And since it's a new year, everybody's forgotten who these other two guys are. Elder Jerry Yancey, why don't you say hello to everybody? That's good. Good job. Elder Mark Rowe, do a better job. <clears throat> hello, everybody. That wasn't a better job, but thanks for trying. Thanks. It's wonderful to be here tonight. Happy New Year's, everyone. Pray you had a happy holiday, a safe and happy holiday. Now we are in 2023, which That's a lot of numbers. So far as I'm concerned, feels a lot like 2022. But I said about 2022, it felt a lot like 2021. I'll stop there. Don't worry. I'm not going any further back. Tonight, it is my great pleasure to announce that we have uh, prayed and feel like the Lord is leading us to talk about the book of Ruth. One of the, maybe the sweetest of all the books of the Bible, and there's some good ones, but this one is maybe the most amazing love story that you'll ever want to read, whether secular or not. It just tells a fan, just a beautiful story. And we have with us tonight, these dear brethren are going to talk to us about, we're going to start with Ruth chapter one, verses one through five. And we're going to begin with Elder Mark Daniel Rao, who's going to give us a historical overview and level set. Did I say that right, Brother Mark? Yes, sir. And then Elder Mark Daniel Montgomery, I mean, Elder Daniel Lawrence Montgomery, will follow up with a discussion that I can't wait to hear the, the how to understand Ruth from a literary perspective. Is that a good way of saying it? Yeah. How he said literary it. device, but we're not ignorant of his devices. I know that for sure. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> we're going to have these two dear brothers give us the uh, initial level set. And then Jerry and I are going to sit back and let James Mosley carry the rest of the show on his shoulders. There you go. Yeah. You didn't know we were going to do that too, Brother James, but we love you so much. We're going to let you have all the rest of the time. I'm just kidding. <clears throat> now let's get our minds going. We're going to talk about Ruth. Let me, we're going to, we're going to go to God in prayer and then I'll read the first five verses and then I'll hand it over to brother Mark and then he'll hand it over to brother Daniel, brother Daniel, will hand it back to me and then all mayhem will ensue. Mm -hmm. So uh, get your, get your gears ready. And get set, and here we go. So, brother, brother James Mosley, would you lead us in word of prayer, please? Our Almighty God, righteous King in heaven, Lord, we come to thee at this time with thankful hearts for thy Son Jesus Christ, Lord, for the redemptive work He's done for us on Calvary. Lord, we're thankful for this truth and the gospel, and we're thankful for the scriptures. Thank you for the opportunity to gather with brothers that we love and to look into thy word. Lord, bless us with a clear mind and a faithful spirit to look at these things and reveal unto us, O oh God, this evening things that we might not have seen before. And let us be thankful and praise thee for the things that we've seen in times past. Lord, we love thee with, with all that we have. And each and every time that we have to gather in thy name, Lord, we know it is a great blessing and an honor. And Lord, may our efforts be according to thy will and, O oh God, to, to thy glory, honor, and praise. These things we petition in the name of thy darling son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Brother James. Now, I'm going to read the first five verses of the first chapter, Ruth. We're going to have... I don't know how many more sessions it'll be at least through this month, maybe into February, but that's okay. <clears throat> it's a wonderful book. It's worthy of our devotion and attention and study. I pray that the Lord will bless us in this study, brethren, and that anything good, dear friends who are listening, you know who to give the glory to anything amiss. 
please cast a mantle of charity over us. And as we always say, we don't want these to take the place of your own personal study. Please don't do that. If anything, may this help you in your studies, but may God bless you all as you study the Bible. It's a blessing to have God's word and it's an even greater blessing to be able to spend time in it and study and inquire of the Lord of his truth. So we're going to read now the first five verses, and then Brother Mark, take it away. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife, and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Kilian, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, <coughs> Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about 10 years. And Malon and Kilian died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Doesn't start very good, does it, brethren? <laughs> but there's a lot to be said about these five verses, right, Brother Mark? I agree. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, like Brother Mike said, I'm going to do just a little bit of um, a historical perspective of the obviously the first five verses, but the book itself, and then give way to Brother Daniel um, to expound to us uh, this literary thing that uh, is actually really, really neat when you use it to look at the book. So, I mean, verse one, there's no surprise during the days of the judges, right? Um, after doing some research, uh, you know, the scholars go as far back as Ehud, which is about 1300 BC. But as you will find out, as we all know, the fact that the mother of Boaz, according to the lineage of, uh, especially in the book of Matthew, I believe, is Rahab of Jericho. And um, that's a little bit early for that. The general consensus, consensus is that this took place during the time of Gideon um, around 1275 B.C., um, if you take what biblical historians say, you'll find the, uh, lineage in the years of Boaz, Boaz around 1300 BC was born, Obed, his son around 1200, Jesse, his grandson around 1100, and then David, his great grandson around 1000 BC, um, it's it's you know it's interesting to think about those things and how they play out, especially given how this book, uh, how these true events unfold uh, in the uh, in the coming chapters. So uh, I'd like to touch on something that, and I don't want to I don't want to necessarily step on toes here, but I would like to touch on something with regard to the economy of that time, or in economic history. Uh, obviously, there was a famine. It's why uh, Elimelech and uh, Naomi and their two sons left. Um, Elimelech, I, I believe, is doing what uh, he should do to try to provide for his family. Um, they're not looking to leave the Jewish religion. They're not looking to uh, become, uh, you know, idolaters down in Moab. Uh, Moab just happened to be a place that was relatively close to where they lived is I will I, I was about to say it's just across the river but it's a little bit further than that but in today's um travel ability you might say for us it would be like a day trip 
I mean, we would leave in the morning, go down to Moab, do our shopping, and then drive back to Bethlehem that evening, and everything's great. Uh, you know, 40, 60, maybe 80 kilometers. Um, but in that day and age, it was a place where the famine was not as impactful as it was in Bethlehem. And so Elimelech went down there temporarily. There was no intention of his staying in Moab. This was a, <clears throat> a economic and even a survival um, uh, means by which he would go with his family and make a living. And then when they had gotten to where they could sustain themselves, they would come back. That was the intention from the get-go, right? The intention was the four of them would go and the four of them would come back. All right. Um, one thing that I like to say, and we sometimes, and I have fallen prey to this, get caught up in Elimelech leaving. Well, he should have never left. Why did he leave? Okay, things were bad in Bethlehem, but they couldn't, you know, they, they were definitely worse down in Moab. Well, we see that from a few, you know, looking back, but Elimelech didn't know anything that was going to happen in Moab. He knew there was a famine. He knew they were struggling. He was concerned about his family. So they went. The point of the book isn't that Elimelech left. The point of the book is that Naomi came back and she brought somebody with her who happens to be the woman who the book is titled after, right? You'll see as we go through this book that the theme of the providence of God permeates every page of this short book that has so much wonderful experience in it that like brother Mike said, I I just love to, I just go read the book of Ruth. I don't know how many times I've read the book of Ruth. It doesn't take 15 minutes to read the book of Ruth. And I always feel good after I read the book of Ruth, right? <laughs> Why is that? It's a great story, but it's also an, an exa a great example of God's providence in the life of Naomi and Ruth and Boaz. And we have to be careful not to always, you know, the what if questions will get you every time. What if Adam didn't eat the fruit? I mean, come on. All right. We're not going to do that. But we certainly don't question God's providence. And when they headed down to Moab and somebody would say, well, they shouldn't have gone to Moab. It, it made me think of the 23rd Psalm when David said, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And while at that table, he says, My cup runneth over. God's providence in our lives, in the lives of, of Elimelech and his family, and you know, Elimelech, Naomi, and his sons, and then eventually uh, his sons' wives, is so evident. Even though they're down in the land of Moab, even though they're mixed up with the idolatry of that day and age. God's providence still is in play. <coughs> Excuse me, is in play. Um, family history. So it says that he sojourned, right? Verse one, went to sojourn in the country of Moab. This was a side trip. This was not a move. It was a trip to go and a trip to come back. Um, he never intended to stay permanently just long enough to let to, to help his family survive. We talked about the meanings of the names. Elimelech, my God is king. Naomi means pleasant or my delight. Uh, Machlon means sick or sickly. Uh, Kilion means pining, which means a mental or a physical declining. So we know that when they get down there, it's not long and Elimelech dies, right? Then Maclon and Kilion get married. They get married to two Moabite women. And then we find out that they die. Um, I made a note. Events are extreme on the bad side of things, right? I mean, this is, you know, you start out, you start out this book in the first five verses, you've got three men dying, leaving three women as widows. And you think, my goodness, that is the worst way to start off a book. But I will submit to you that it's probably one of the best ways to start off a book, especially this book, uh, to understand how God is moving in the lives of Naomi and Ruth in particular. Um, what do we say about Moab? Um, 
the god that was worshipped is uh, Chamash. Um, there was ch child sacrifice paid to Chamash. Wasn't all that great, right? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Just like Molech, and you go to Numbers 21, Jeremiah 32, read about that. Moab was 100% worldly. Their religion was world-based. It was not God-based. They I worshiped idols. And there was a hate-hate relationship between Israel and Moab. Give you some reference on that. Numbers 22 and 23, and then obviously Judges chapter 3. Um, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't the greatest relationship between those two, um, countries. And that particular thought does make you question why Elimelech chose Moab. But like I said before, it's strictly from an economic view. It was the closest place they could go that wasn't suffering from the famine that had overtaken Bethlehem at the time. So a lot of history involved in those first five verses, a lot of, of uh, important points to understand, especially given the providence of God and how this book plays out. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Brother Daniel, who will um, take us away on a literary adventure. So many good points uh, <laughs> and numerous rabbits I wish to chase and you know, have a Dr. Pepper with, uh, but not going to do it. Okay, so um, so what I would like to talk about, now, Brother Mark has done a really good job <clears throat> of laying out who it is that we're talking about here. And um, so what we, how should you read this very short book? Um, when people ask me, Hey, Brother Daniel, and you'd be surprised, nobody, very few people ask me this question, but if they were to ask me this question, this is the answer I would give. Hey, Brother Daniel, where would you start reading the Bible? I'd say, Book of Ruth, Book of James, and the Sermon on the Mount. Those are my, those are my surefire answers that I, I give them, and uh, I mean, if you want to start wherever you want to start, go right ahead, but what is so great about Ruth is that it's short and it's narrative and it and if you can understand the language and the pacing of the narrative then Ruth is actually very easy to follow along with you'll spend the rest of your life chewing on it but the narrative itself the trick to it is understanding um, some of the cultural context one and two, you need to understand that the book is designed for us, the reader, to follow along this journey with Ruth. Uh, it, it's like, well, Naomi's a big character. Boaz is, is, is huge in this story. But if you as the reader can engage this story from Ruth's perspective, then you can kind of understand uh, kind of, you can really understand the point of the book. Like I was trying to think here, like uh, what's a, what's a, a story that I could, uh, talk about that everybody kind of knows about. And if you want to throw a brick at my head for, for bringing it up, you can, but, um, in the wizard of Oz, for instance, uh, Dorothy knows nothing about Oz. She doesn't know a thing, not one thing. People have to stop along the way Characters have to stop along the way and explain the land of Oz to her as the story unfolds. Like the, you know, the Scarecrow and the Tin Man and the Cowardly Lion. And, you know, Glinda comes down and basically explains the whole thing to her right at the, <laughs> right at the beginning of the movie when it all goes to color, right? That's basically it. That, that, is, that is a literary device that is actually quite common. It is the idea of the novice and the expert. So if there is something with a high cultural context, like Dorothy's in Kansas, everybody gets Kansas. Okay, now we're in, the, in Oz, and we know nothing about this place, not a single thing. Don't know a thing about it. They have to stop and explain it to her. Dorothy's the novice. Ruth is the novice for when it comes to the ways of Israel. 
okay, to the ways of Judah. She's the novice. She doesn't know the, I mean, she's lived with this family and she's lived as one of them in this household that still um, uh, ab abided by uh, the laws of Judah and of Israel and all the customs therein. But now she's actually going to this place. She's going there. She's going to live this life. And there are things that happen in the story where the story has to stop so that it can be explained to Ruth. And when it's getting explained to Ruth, you know who it's really getting explained to? It's getting explained to us. That's what's happening. So uh, let, let's just kind of, we're going to take a really quick overview of the book of Ruth just to kind of give you an anchor point of how this whole thing unfolds. So, like we said, there was a famine in the land of Judah, and they were living in Bethlehem. I hope everybody remembers Bethlehem. We just had Christmas. Okay. So, there was a famine in Bethlehem. Elimelech was a landowner in Bethlehem. So, famine equals problem. Okay. He, uh, on one side of the Dead Sea is Bethlehem. On the other side of the Dead Sea is Moab. Fun fact, there are no tributaries from the Dead Sea that go west. They only go east, okay? There, you have to keep going east towards the coast to find, you know, places to, to, um, to really grow food, that kind of stuff. So he had to go straight to the other side of the Dead Sea where there was water and things and you know now you can grow so now he's over there he takes his two sons he takes his wife and um and Elimelech immediately dies or at least that's the way it is in the story it seems like it's very soon Elimelech dies and then they're there another 10 years during this 10 years the boys marry two women of that land which is why they're novices okay they don't know anything about Israel at all Okay, so 10 years later, the boys die. Naomi says, I'm going back. And um, Orpah, one of the daughters, uh, decides to stay behind, and Ruth decides to go with her. I'm skipping over a lot because we got a lot to cover. Okay, I'm trying to get to this one spot. Okay, so they go back to Bethlehem, and um, here is the cultural context that is so difficult to understand. This is really the first expert thing that is going on with Naomi that Ruth needs to get. The very first one is this, that not only was um, it, Naomi was embarrassed and poor. And here's what I mean by that. Um, women were not allowed to spend money. Okay, they could not do that. That was not a thing that they could do in their culture. Uh, they were not allowed to touch an estate. The, these are all things that were done by the husband. The women had other things to do, but that was not it. So uh, there is all of, there, uh, there is Elimelech's estate, and Naomi can't touch it. Okay, uh, maybe she could in Moab. I don't know. It's different rules or whatever. But she comes home and she has no husband with which to buy fields or to do things or any sorts of stuff like this. So she she's she is very very poor, and I don't want to get into this. But there were provisions for the poor at that time. But the the whole point is that Ruth is with Naomi, and they're very very poor. On top of this, Naomi is also embarrassed because it was a shame, a shame for a family, for that to have happened to a family. There were no extra husbands. There were no brothers. There were no sons. There was nobody, nobody to help out Naomi and Ruth. And everybody had their heart out for Naomi and Ruth, but the law was the law. And Naomi was just stuck. She was absolutely stuck. She couldn't buy it. She couldn't do anything. All she could do was live in poverty under Israel law. That's her only card to play. That's the only card that she had. Ruth gets that they're poor. 
but she has no context, no upbringing to understand exactly how embarrassed Naomi is. Not a clue. Not a clue, which is why, and this is, for me is the crux of the whole story, Naomi finds out that Ruth has been receiving some charity from a man named Boaz, who was a kindred to Elimelech. And that's when the fireworks start going off in Naomi's head. And she explodes and she has this huge reaction. You know what? He could be the relative. He could be the guy that gets us out of poverty. He can be our relative. Like th this, I, I, Naomi's like, I, I never in a million years would I thought this happened. I never would have thought this. And Ruth, Ruth is like, okay, <laughs> Ruth, oh, all right. Naomi is having this big, big, big moment. Ruth is having a much more simple, honest moment. She's not, uh, you know, mad or upset or anything with Naomi. She's just not there. You know, she's not there with that understanding. That is how you read the book of Ruth. You look at everything that Ruth reacts to. My, my fault, the first time that I read the book of Ruth, was that I was like, I wanted to I wanted to feel what Naomi felt when she had this big reaction to Bo to finding out that Boaz could possibly be the solution to all their problems. And and I just didn't get it. Like I just didn't get it. And then I realized, you know what? Ruth didn't either. That's the point. As the story goes, you realize that Ruth is taking this direct path to Boaz. She's not looking at the global outlook of all of the culture and everything. She's having this honest path towards this man in love. And Naomi is seeing this global thing going on. And so it's not just about the redemption of a family. It's about Ruth walking into a way of life and understanding it and choosing to be in it. That's how you get going. That is the novice becomes the expert. You just follow Ruth all the way to the end. And then at the very end, when Naomi has that moment holding that baby, I'm sorry, the spoiler alert, guys. I'm so sorry. When Ruth, when Naomi is holding that baby, that's when you feel it for Naomi because you, as Ruth, have made the transition from novice to expert. And you just read that text of Naomi holding that baby to the bosom, and I'm like, uh, the tears, the tears have come. They are falling now, okay? So follow Ruth. Let Ruth be your guide. And if you, if you get stuck on something, read it again. Just pretend like you're Ruth. I can't imagine how many times Ruth must have had things explained to her. Okay, just over and over and over again. And it was not out of, oh, this is dumb or whatever. No, she was really sincere. She was a genuine novice, as are we all. Mike, I think he's done. Uh, phew, I couldn't hit the button fast enough. <laughs> wow. <laughs> really good. Both of you. Fantastic. Pardon me. I'm going to go read the book of Ruth. I'll be back in a little It didn't take you long. I hope so. <laughs> don't move your lips as you read it, okay? <laughs> excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent. I, both of them really go hand in glove, in my humble opinion. Mm. Um, we're going to talk about this, obviously, now, more detail, especially the first five verses. Uh, <clears throat> we understand now from what Mark told us, why they went to Moab. Moab wasn't that far away, but it wasn't just like across the river. There mm -hmm. was uh, the point, I suppose, there is they, they went to Moab <clears throat> and there they settled and it was they didn't intend to stay there for the rest of their lives. But as it turned out, Elimelech and the two boys, that was the rest of their lives. Right, yeah. right. And uh, then we, we have... Uh, I like the, the definition of the names because, uh, believe it or not, those names really give an under, undercurrent of what the meaning is going on, mm -hmm. what 
what Naomi was facing and what uh, Orpa and Ruth were thinking. And then to understand Ruth from the standpoint, you, when you read it today, us today, we read it, we read it uh, like we were Ruth, not, mm-hmm. not uh, that we are actually Ruth, but we, we don't know anything more than what Ruth knows. <clears throat> and that that's really important for all of us to know as we read Ruth is that it, we're not meant at the get go to understand why things are happening the way they are, why right. Boaz acts as he right. does, why Naomi acts as excited as she does. But we will get excited uh, the more that we learn. And, I, you know, there's some thoughts about the church there, I suppose we, yeah. we could. Uh, I hope that we get into that, Brother Jerry, Brother James, mm-hmm. how that that. Uh, is like uh, someone who comes to the truth. Maybe that's that's uh, a little bit of what we should be getting into at some point. So thank you to your work's not done yet. You still have about 50 minutes a piece of uh, further discussion. <laughs> well, brother that's, James, what, that's what we got I brother James for. for yeah. Huh? <laughs> I said that's what we got brother James for. Right. <laughs> well, brother James, we're thankful to have you on with us tonight. Uh, you have any thoughts you want to get us launched off with, brother James? Uh, I probably have more Questions? thoughts than... Um, have time or anything, but and, I'm, and I definitely hope that what I say doesn't detract from um, the trajectory of, of the wonderful thoughts we've heard so far. And uh, I agree with you, Brother Jerry. I need to go back and reread it again. <laughs> the uh, frame of mind that Brother Daniel, as you shared about that moving from novice to expert, that's a wonderful framework to go and, and to read it. Um, but I think that that falls in line with how I felt about the book of Ruth already is that it's in four chapters. It's an absolute treasure trove mm-hmm. of beauty in, in all these different ways. It's a very dynamic and manifold book. And I felt like I uh, knew it quite well. And then you read it again and there's something new is. And so with the opportunity that I've been blessed with to, to look at these things with you gentlemen and, and, um, to read these things, I had a heads up of which verses we were going to be looking at. And uh, I was like, are you serious? Can we like, can we jump board a little bit? Because the first five verses, are, you know, if you just bracket them, they're not the brightest of verses. You have, it starts with a famine and it ends with death. It looks like, right. can we get to the next part? But, but what I do also believe is true is, is, um, 2 Timothy 3, 16 says that all scripture is given inspiration of God and it's profitable. And, and if that weren't true, then this five verses by itself wouldn't have any good stuff in it. And I just don't think right. that that's true. I, I believe that these five verses alone, there's a lot of beauty in it if you just look at it alone. Um, and one way that I believe we can look at scripture, or we should look at scripture first and foremost, is when we read, we ought to be looking for Jesus Christ. And that, that doesn't matter where you're at in Bible, wherever you're looking, be looking for Jesus because he's in all of it. Um, and another important thing for us to do when we're reading God's word is to look at it as if it's a mirror and take it personal. Because mm. these things aren't just for academic knowledge of understanding of what right. the Bible says. It's for us and it's for our life and it's for uh, it, it serves a purpose in our lives. So we ought to take it personal um we should and the, the fact of the matter is, is when we we think about what happened to elimelech and naomi and their two sons as they leave their home they leave bethlehem judah and by their choice they weren't forced out it was by their choice that they left um but as you said brother mark the focus shouldn't be on the fact that they left but that that they returned absolutely true but in, in our lives, I haven't faced a famine. I, I trust none of y'all have faced a famine. We live in a country where we access to food, maybe too, too much access, right? I mean, we, I've never faced a natural famine. So when we look at it, we have to look at it and take it personal that they left because of a famine. Think about it more broadly and, and what other types of things might fall as a category as a famine in our life. Um, that would cause us to leave home, so to speak, and maybe not naturally leave home or your hometown, but but there's ways in which we can depart. So 
generally speaking of those things, um, I kind of go through time frames in my life where something might have caused me to to leave or to depart because of a famine. Or and another way mm. to think about that is um, a lack of satisfaction. That there's something there that that ought to give you satisfaction that you don't feel like it's giving you satisfaction. Uh, things such as um, maybe a, a job opportunity. Yeah. You know, maybe uh, your, your kids have hit a certain age and, and all the other kids around you or all the other kids are doing sports. And, and maybe that is a certain satisfaction that you feel like your family is lacking. Or maybe you see people uh, with an opportunity to go to school um, across the country where maybe there, there isn't church or, or family around. There's different ways in which we can see um, ourselves kind of in the shoes, so to speak, of Elimelech and Naomi and those two sons. <laughs> that they leave home because of a famine because those famine life, life happens, right? <laughs> life is going to happen. And in, in that our priorities are going to be challenged and we're going to be faced with a situation where we have to take inventory of, of what's important and what are we going to do? Um, so for them, for that family, they got put into a very uncomfortable situation. It was a new situation. A famine had had hit, and life as they knew it had changed. They were put mm. in a new situation. And as anybody, you, you would poll the masses, and what we'd find is we, we don't like change. Mm. We're not comfortable with change. <laughs> and <clears throat> when things are changing around us in life, we're going to react to those things. And, and the question is, is are we going to make the right choices? Are we going to make the wrong choices? Sometimes we, we do. And sometimes we don't. Um, we might find ourselves out in Moab, so to speak. And in whatever aspect that might be in that picture, we might find ourselves in, in Moab and because, because of the choices that we made to that change. Um, but when we stop and think, and, and we, we reground ourselves, we realize that our God, that God of Elimelech, he says his name even means um, God is my king. That, that same God that Ruth knew that your God will be my God and your people, my people. She came to know their God and, it, and she took it upon herself as her God. Our God is one that does not change. And that's something that we can rejoice in knowing that we serve a God that does not change, as Malachi 3, 6 says, um, therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. That in him there is no variableness, nor shadow of turning. God does not change. So even if the circumstances around us, even if home changes, even if famines come in our lives, God does not change. And we ought to keep the right um, perspective and grounding in knowing that he is priority and that, that he'll feed us in, in times of so-called famine. Um, so anyway, that's my thoughts on it. Uh, I pray Man. that's good. Amen. Good thoughts. Yes. <laughs> yes. Amen. Really good thoughts. Oh, man. I have I, no idea what I want to do. <laughs> did you finish reading the book of Ruth? You said yeah, you did you? Uh, <laughs> I, I can't get past the fifth verse of the first chapter. Um, okay. You know, Brother Mark, Brother Daniel, um, Brother James as well, and, and Mike, you too, that the thoughts that you guys have set forth, I think, really serve to to ground us. And I feel ex I feel more excited now about going forward in study of the Book of Ruth than even I did when we talked about it um, initially. I was very, very, very happy and thankful when we initially talked about it as a as a group to uh, undertake the book of Ruth, that we were going to take it initially from a historical perspective. I think that's imperative. Mm. Um, Brother Mark, you mentioned God's providence is seen throughout the entirety of the book. Uh, providence in, in scripture, it, it, I believe it's only in scripture two times. Um, by definition, it's forethought, it's provident care, Providence supply and provision. Uh, it's not another word that starts with P, <laughs> predetermined or predestinate. Mm. Um, 
a lot of times, if I just maybe get this off my chest a little bit, um, and I, I trust it'll be of value. A lot of times when we look at scripture relative to the uh, redemptive history of God's people in the Old Testament, sometimes in the New, pointing back to the Old, but when we consider the redemptive history um, of, of God's people, um, the tendency sometimes is because we are reading it after the fact, we are able to see the end of the matter as, as we go through it. Where the mark you made the point, uh, Elimelech, <laughs> he didn't know what was going to happen in Moab. He was focused on one thing, and that was take care of his family. That's God honoring. Mm -hmm. And we do spend too much time sometimes trying to spiritualize or understand what would make uh, Elimelech leave. Or uh, I mean, and then he died. Was God punishing him? I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's just conjecture, yeah. and it, it muddies the mm -hmm. water to the point that we will lose the value of the book of Ruth. Yeah. We will lose it. Um, Brother Daniel, the points that you made relative to placing ourselves in the historical setting and try to look through the eyes of Ruth and perhaps even some of the other characters, but primarily Ruth, because that's where the gleaning and the learning is going to come through. I, I, was, uh, I was just overwhelmingly thankful when we had the conversation a week or so ago and, and we started talking about this and you just lo laid that uh, literary um, uh, pattern out in front of me. It was like well, lights started coming off and bells started ringing and fireworks and all these things. And so it's exciting. And I'll tell you what, the word of God should be exciting. Right. Because Brother James Christ is in there, right? Yeah. It should be exciting. What challenge that I think a lot of us have sometimes is we will approach scripture with a preset notion in our mind. Yes. Amen. Um, the book of Ruth speaks about redemption. Well, I like redemption. I like redemption a lot. <laughs> if I go to the book of Ruth with a preset notion of uh, eternal blood-bought redemption, mm. <clears throat> I'm going to stumble all over myself and I'm going to miss the mark. Put ourselves in the setting. Look at it through the eyes of Ruth as it's already been clearly lined out in front of us. It, the tendency sometimes, because we can see, we look back upon it. We have, we have the end result of the matter. Right. A lot of times we'll make the mistake of, substituting God's providential care of his people as the history of, of their lives move forward and will slide in the fact that um, he does everything according to his will in the army of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand. And we'll quote that sometimes from the perspective of God just orchestrates things all through the, through history. Mm. And that's not what happens. That's not the God of the Bible. Look at this account and see the behaviors of the characters in the book of Ruth. Look at it from, if you want to apply it to our own situation, look at our own, and Brother James, you, you put it wonderfully. You know, in, in history, and we're making history every day, we're making history even right now, because <laughs> tomorrow it's going to be history. We find some behaviors and their consequences having a profoundly positive effect. And then we find some behaviors and their consequences having a negative effect. Well, that's what history is. It's, it's a, an accounting of that. Putting ourselves here in this book, even writing these first few verses, the time of Judges. How often do we go to the, the, the uh, book of Judges and read? How often do we look at it? How often do we try to preach out of it? Say, well, no, there's better things to talk about than that. Mm. If we want to understand through the eyes of Ruth and this setting, we need to understand something about what is recorded in the book of Judges. Brother Mark, you laid it out perfectly. From a historical perspective, the book of Ruth is there, what, in between the middle of the second chapter and into the fourth, perhaps, from a timing perspective. What was going on? 
during that time. Those are things that I think that help our understanding and our Bible study bring us to a point of having the word, um, be, being enlightened by what's going on. Uh, the book of Ruth didn't start in these five verses, as has already been mentioned, without value and purpose. The first word, now. Mm -hmm. Okay, This is a right now situation yeah. for these folks. Is it a right now situation for us as we try to understand the book of Ruth? Well, it ought to be. It ought to be if we're going to understand it. And, and then the time of, of judges and the things that were going on, the setting with the nation of Israel. Uh, as, as I understand it, history pins it as between the death of Joshua and, and before the birth of Samuel. There, there was no visible leader of the children of Israel as it had been. And so you, you find a lot of the tribes self-dependent and, and even isolated one from another. Um, you know, those are things that, that they experience firsthand. And I think a lot of times we look at stuff like that and we just kind of blow right through it. Mm. Well, Scripture would have us to think about it because that's the backdrop as we go forward in the book of Ruth. So I'm, I'm, ex I'm so excited, you guys. I think... I think this is going to be a, an outstanding study and pray that the Lord will just lead us and guide us through it. Amen. Well, <clears throat> I have a lot to learn about Ruth, obviously. I, I, I really have learned a lot from listening to what you brethren have said about it. And I thank you very much for that. Um, I don't think we've said it yet, or maybe some, if one of you have said this, I apologize, I, but I don't recall, but, <clears throat> Ruth is in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She is, as Brother Mark said, the great grandmother. Is that right? That's of correct. David. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so in the lineage of our Lord, there are two women that were not natural born Hebrews. They, they would be what we call Gentiles. Yeah. One was Rahab, mm -hmm. who factors in the line of Boaz. And then, here is Ruth, and Ruth was a Moabitess, and as Brother Mark so well said, Moabite, the Moabites were not the best of friends to the nation of Israel. I mean, you, you read the Exodus, and you read about a time when the people of Moab refused to let them right. uh, yeah. pass through their land, and you know, so they, but they were distantly related, Moab through Lot, and Israel through. Uh, Abraham, um, Ruth and Orpah. We don't really know anything more about their background except they were Moabitess. And when uh, we'll, we'll we'll read next time about Brother James when the good stuff that you're wanting to get to. So you're welcome to be here oh, with us. All good. Yeah. Next week too. Mm. Uh, but when they leave, uh, they they uh, Naomi and her two daughter in laws. They they start. And they get a little a little on the way, and then Naomi tells the two girls, "Just go back. I don't want to do this to you. You know, just go back with your people. I, you don't deserve this kind of misery." And Orpah, I think, does give it a shot at trying to be a good daughter-in-law. But when Naomi pretty much lets her off the hook, she she's gone. But something about Ruth, and that's the whole thing about the story. There's just something about Ruth. Yep. And uh, we'll get into I don't know if we can get into it, but I hope we will. What was it in Ruth that made her just absolutely so uh, endeared or dedicated to her mother-in-law? Uh, this is a story that mother-in-laws ought to love. <laughs> You know, this, <laughs> if you if you are a mother in law, then read Ruth. It's it's uh it's great. So Ruth is a sweet girl. She's naive. She doesn't know is it anything about the ways of the nation of Israel, the people of Israel. But isn't it interesting that having no knowledge of the law of Moses or the customs or traditions of the of the Jewish people or the, or the Israelitish people as, as they would be known at that time, <clears throat> her humility 
and graciousness endeared her to everyone she met. Mm-hmm. At least the, of those that we read about in the story. Right. Right. I don't know that that could have been said about anybody other than a person like Ruth. And I can see <clears throat> characteristic traits of Ruth in Jesus Christ. Um, I don't know. That, it may just be me, but that's what I see. So Ruth <clears throat> Ruth can be seen in different ways. I'm not sure what, what is the, the best way, <clears throat> but... I think she gives hope to us Gentiles, us non-Jewish mm-hmm. people, because she became one of the one of the family. Yeah, she did, didn't she? Mm-hmm. Yeah, she became one of the family, and I I think we as primitive Baptists, as the, like to think of ourselves as the church, we ought to be uh, looking for the Ruths <laughs> that are out there. Amen. Yeah. yeah, look for the Ruths. They're out yeah. there. The, Imagine a church full of Ruths. <laughs> that would be what a church that would be. And we we ought to be careful not to uh, be overjudging or or so hardcore on the traditions with people in their first efforts to mingle among us. I mean, my goodness, what would have happened to Ruth if Boaz had been a one of those really strict and stern kind? But uh, nevertheless, Ruth could be seen as a uh, hope for us Gentiles. She could be seen as uh, a picture of the church. She could be seen as a picture mm-hmm. of someone coming to the church. Um, Boaz could be seen as a type of Christ in some, some respects. Uh, we'll get into that more often. No, the redemption thing, but the jury's right. It's not blood redemption. It's a really unique form of redemption mm-hmm. that meant something to the Israelites that <laughs> means nothing to us today because it just doesn't right. make sense. Right. Yeah, you have to read about it to get. Right. Why did they take the shoe off? Why do they have to do this? And, but it was important. And uh, but what's under what's undeniable is the love story aspect of this. Right. right. I mean, uh, the Bible's not big for the kind of romance novels <laughs> that we <laughs> see it proliferated all over the place. But what a sweet romance this right. was! It was a true love story. It really was. I can certainly see in that aspects of the love that Christ has for his church. Yep. And uh, <clears throat> the, what made Ruth worth fellowship among the people of Israel was the fact that she was who she was and, and the fact that such a great man as Boaz loved her and uh, made provision for her. And uh, we'll get into that more, I suppose. You know how how old much the age difference between Boaz and Ruth, and what what uh, you know what what a bit of a risk Boaz took to his uh, reputation, maybe. And the uh, <clears throat> why would why would Naomi tell Ruth to go sleep at the feet of Boaz? And, and I, you know we'll get into that. I, I don't really understand a lot of that, but there's a there's some beautiful truths to that. Yeah. There's some interesting language in Ruth, like the word hap. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, right. right. The word hap. Uh, the, the handfuls of purpose. That's become right. almost a cliche. Uh, uh, bringing in the sheaves uh, maybe comes from that, uh, from the story of Ruth, too. Um, gleaning in the master's field. Uh, there's so many uh, memes. We use that word today, right, Brother James? Memes. That's that's it, right. <laughs> I don't know. There's Ruth memes that people don't even know came from Ruth, but they're all over the place. No, no, Daniel. Is that no, no, you're saying no? No, no. Okay. Mo- moving on. <laughs> okay. Well, I thought I, I, I would take a shot. I was just. <laughs> <a shot. clears throat> uh, so, I, you know, the Bible is not big on describing how people look, but you get the standpoint, you get the sense that that Boaz thought Ruth was beautiful. <laughs> And, you know, love will make you think about people what maybe other people wouldn't think, right? And it's really immaterial what she looked like. It was what the beauty that was inside Ruth that appealed, that just shone out. So I think we're getting to the end of the hour, aren't we? We're getting close to it. And I know this is a uh, <clears throat> introductory discussion. We'll get into the meat of it. And uh, hopefully these... Uh, 
these, uh, you know, Daniel and brother D James will feel like they can be a part of it as much as we go on. As a matter of fact, you ought to, since you, you made such a big statement, Daniel, about, about the literary device. I'm so sorry. I feel like I've just been to so, rhetoric so school. <laughs> <laughs> That's a rhetorical statement, Daniel. I don't mean, I don't mean for you to say anything back. Okay. So <clears throat> let's have some closing statements. I got, and, uh, I got closing brother, statements. brother Daniel, you have any closing statements you want to? Um, I, I think it's so because the book is so short, it's easy to reread and rereading it is essential. It's absolutely Meantime. essential because if you have read this book and then you go back and read it again, you'll know, um, how Naomi's reaction to her two daughters-in-law, like, go away y'all go back return to your mothers you know by the end of the fifth verse that she's completely bitter by this point so it, there's the first time you read it you just kind of get in the sense of what's going on in naomi's head the second time you read it you're like oh <laughs> okay and so like i mean you just want to peel back some of those names a little bit maklon sorry i'm going to say these correctly maklon and Kilion. Nobody cares. Okay. Maklon and Kilion, uh, their names mean um, essentially sick and lazy. That's, <laughs> right, that's what right. they're like. That's what their names are. That's like if a Limelech. Uh, and and this, is, this is where I think perhaps, you know, Maklon and Kilion, their, their particular names, I, I don't think they necessarily. I'll just put it like this. Do you think a Limelech would name his sons after the seven dwarfs? Okay, like here's Dopey and Hungry. Like th that's really what these guys are named. They're named Sick and Lazy. That's what their names are. Imagine being that mother. Imagine being that mother. Imagine being that mother now without your husband and all you have are sons, Sick and Lazy, and these two daughters-in-law for 10 years. Then you go into the reaction that the girls have to their mother-in-law. They worshiped this woman. She, they thought she hung the moon. But Naomi is, how many of you guys know a caretaker in your life? Someone that has been someone who has taken care of the sick. Like, you know that personality. You know who that person is. And you know what? Everybody loves that person. You know who loves that person the least? that person <laughs> you know that that's that's just kind of how that personality is naomi was the anchor of that family she was at her wits end and upon second reading you get the sense of that by the fifth verse and then you get into the next little bit where it's talk where she's talking to her daughters-in-law telling them to go away and you're really getting a sense of naomi's head and her heart like really where, where, where her head is and where her heart is because she has got such a huge heart to give, but she is so down and out and she's so distressed, just so distressed. And you read those five verses differently. You feel them for how dark they absolutely are, specifically to Naomi. They're so dark. This is the worst possible. This is just awful, awful news, terrible circumstances, like Job level stuff. Okay. <laughs> And you get to the end of that five verses and then you meet Ruth. Mm -hmm. And that's when you see a little bit of sunshine. And that's, th that's the setup for the whole story is this dark, awful, no good, bad circumstance. And then Ruth. Mm -hmm. So read those first five verses for as dark as they really are. It'll change the book for you. Mm -hmm. James, you have any closing thoughts? So many. Um, I'm going to latch on to something Brother Jerry said and about it's important also for I mean, to really think about this happening in a timeline um, of what was happening at the time, right? It even says it's going on at the, in the days of the judges. So when we think about judges, that's a time period in which um, – kind of an overarching theme, like a 30,000 view, view of that 
time period, it was a time when Israel was going up and down, right? Of, of obeying God and turning to him and then going back down of, of being disobedient and turning away from God. And then it judges raises up, up and down, up and down. Um, this was in that time period. So that's kind of zooming down to the ground level and seeing a, a case study of, of the day and life of a person that lived in the time of the judges. Mm-hmm. And with that, we're able to see a story, a real account of real people where they went through the down and the up again. And, and that's a beautiful um, thought to me. Um, so I appreciate that, Brother Jerry. And I, I appreciate all of y'all's thoughts this, this evening. It's really made me think about a lot of things. So, Thank you. Brother, Brother Mark? Ooh. Yeah, I was... Uh, yeah, my head was exploding while Daniel and you and James and Jerry, the thoughts that came into my... My head is like, oh, I want to say this. But this is a closing thought, so I'll keep it brief. Um, very well stated um, at the disposition of Naomi, uh, really at the end of the fifth verse, and then that her disposition begins to be shown to us down in the sixth, seventh, eighth, you know, I'm, am I going to, I'm, you know, I'm too old to have any more sons. Would you wait around for, her? I mean, it's like, wow. Um, this, this woman is, is at her wits end, if you will. Um, I mean, she's got nothing good to say. And even when she gets back to uh, Bethlehem, she doesn't have anything good to say. I'm bitter. I'm a bitter woman. <laughs> um, you know, Brother Daniel talked about how we learn along with Ruth. Um, you know, th- there's also some learning to do with Naomi. Um, because, you know, the, it, she starts out just bitter, oh. at her wits end, <clears throat> just, just depressed. And then uh, at the end, it's not just Ruth that experiences this this love effect but is naomi as well and to watch her transition daniel you brought up about how ruth came back and naomi's like what where'd you go where you been you know i i i feel naomi in that I, you know mm-hmm. it's just like it's everything oh it's just terrible it's terrible where have you been and then you start to see naomi come out of mm. that depression out of that despair and we come out with her yes uh because you read the first you know the first six seven eight verses of chapter one you're like oh my goodness this is terrible um but then you start getting further and further into it and you see ruth learning and then you see naomi experiencing joy through what ruth learns Mm -hmm. and then what eventually happens as you get down to the third chapter and the fourth right. chapter, obviously. Um, it's a wonderful book. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's a wonderful lessons, uh, but read it like Brother Daniel talked about. Learn with Ruth, and it's just a fantastic love story, you know? Right. I, and I don't like, I don't read love novels or whatever you know is out there that a lot of people do i don't but when i read ruth i get pulled in Mm -hmm. so allow yourself to be pulled in in your studies of the book of ruth as you read it as you study as you meditate it allow yourself to be pulled in and see how beautiful it goes from deep darkness to a glorious light and the journey from the darkness to the light is so fantastic uh, to undertake. So I really encourage you to do that. <laughs> and I'm going to be quiet now. Mm. Mm. Brother Jerry. Thank you, Brother Mark. Brother Jerry. Yeah, I'm going to take Brother Mark's advice. I'm going to go read the book of Ruth. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for the third time tonight. Third time tonight. <laughs> oh, so many amazing thoughts uh you brothers have have put forth yeah let me just by way of a quick close closing thoughts there's no such thing i can tell this right now uh 
we've talked about the the meanings of some of the names of the characters in the first five verses, and we haven't really talked about the name Ruth uh, mm-hmm. very much. That name, um, by definition, is friend. Mm-hmm. I might add to it a true friend. That is a term, friend, that um, <laughs> try as I might, I am trying to only use that word from a biblical perspective in my life these days. Mm. Uh, I have to work at it. We, we throw those terms around like nothing. Friend. Uh, by the way, a friend is not someone who you may be able to defriend or mm. unfriend. Mm. Right. I'll just toss that out for you know, <laughs> two cents. Uh, Ruth, brother Mike, Ruth was a true friend. Yeah. She was a true friend in, in every sense of the word. And uh, I want to be, <laughs> I want to be her. <laughs> I want to be that friend. Um, you know, what lies in store for us as we study through this is just is very very exciting, brother Daniel. You have uh, you need to clear your docket, brother, because you need to be a part of these discussions as we go forward. You brought forward um, some thoughts that have really, really, really stirred me up, right? Um, and I'm thankful for that. Very, very, yeah. very thankful for that. Um, to consider these first five verses from the darkness that Naomi is feeling Mm -hmm. is profound. Mm -hmm. She's at home. Her husband's name is my God is King. They're, they're serving God. A famine hits. He says, we got to move. Oh, really? Where? Moab. What? (laughs) 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 We're moving where? And they, and off they go. Right. And then we follow the, the account through through the verses and, and, and the sons. And the, I love what was said about that. There's a word in Ruth 1, verse 5 that I'm going to just hit. And then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Brother Mike. And the woman was left mm. of her two sons and her husband. She was left to remain. She was left to remain. She was left to remain, Brother Daniel, under Jewish law. Yes. Which meant something relative to her ability to to sustain herself. She had no ability to that. She went out full, which is recorded in the first uh, chapter, verse 21. She went out full. But then she says, the Lord brought me back empty. Mm That would be a fun one to uncover and to talk about a little bit. Because she did. She went out full. She had a husband and two sons. She right. comes back now, left to remain. That had to be very fearful mm. for her. And consider the downward spiral that that <laughs> we find ourselves in in the fifth verse. We need to hurry up and get beyond it, guys. <laughs> and climb, climb on out. Brothers, bless your hearts. You have, oh, you have brought so many wonderful things to light in just these few verses at the beginning of this book. I look forward to our study. Thank you. You know, you, Brother Jerry, and the rest of you, you, you raised my mind this interesting thought, at least interesting to me. <clears throat> I agree that Elimelech <clears throat> left uh, Bethlehem and Frada to Moab because he felt like he had no choice. Mm-hmm. And people say, "Well, he should." And you're right, Mark. They, they they say, "Well, he should have stayed. He should have. He shouldn't have gone." And uh, <clears throat> I think if we walked a mile in his shoes, we probably would have gone. Yep. He, yeah. We 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 only know that he's of uh, the people that live there. He went, but surely other people went to Moab too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, went, exactly. I, I wouldn't be a bit right. surprised if that yep. he went to Moab because others had gone to Moab, and somebody said, "Hey." It's not it's not not so good down here, but it's better than where where you are right now. Mm-hmm. You know, Abraham went to Egypt, and yeah, yeah. Uh, he went to Egypt twice, and it was they were both disastrous trips. So, I'm not faulting them for going, but I will say this: if they had stayed, 
it wouldn't have been any worse, <laughs> you know, if right. they'd say they'd, mm -hmm. they, who knows what, a, what would have happened. Uh, Elimelech probably would have still died. Dopey and lazy probably, probably still, still, have, still died. And, you know, Boaz seems to be, have been doing well during that time. He had grain growing. Yep. Well, may, maybe it just was the hap that where his land was and then had mm. access to water. <laughs> but my point I'm getting to is this. <clears throat> What if Naomi had stayed in Moab mm. and not come back home? Mm. It's not so much that they left. We can argue till the cows come home about whether they should have left or whether they should. But I tell you what, what if she hadn't come back? Yeah. What would have happened to her? Boaz would have never happened to her. Yeah. Mm. But... My, I guess a point to get out of this is this. If your life is not going great, get back home, Go home. where the Lord is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Come back home. It may, may not be good for a while. It may seem like it's getting worse. Mm -hmm. But things will happen in the Lord's land that won't happen anywhere else. Amen. 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 And if I get anything now from just listening to these brethren talk, when I'm in trouble, I don't want to get away from the church. I want to get in and, st and stay there. And that's where the answers are. That's where the deliverance is. Am I wrong, brethren? No, you no, are not. No, wrong. should be 100 a knee -jerk, right. knee jerk reaction to get back to the church as fast as humanly possible. No. Amen. Amen. Well, just don't wait till we it. get to chapter two. Yeah. yeah, that's right. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait. Brother James, you got to be there for that. I mean, you just got to be there. For that. <laughs> You've been through the valley of the of despair, the valley yeah. of death. Yeah. We're about yeah. to come up out. We're about to start coming up out, peeking yeah. up into the sunshine, brother, into the rare air of the Mount Zion. Okay, so God bless you all. We're going to say a closing word of prayer. Brother Daniel, would you say our closing prayer, please? Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this opportunity to meet and worship your name. Lord, we thank you for uh, this panel, this study that we're having. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for the book of Ruth uh, and for giving us so much hope through its study and through the understanding of uh, what it means to follow you, to be one of your disciples and to be in the church and to keep that oath and to walk in it all the days of our lives. Lord, we ask that you continue on with us. Be with all those who are sick and afflicted. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So say goodnight to everyone, dear brothers. Good night, everyone. Good night.